Manishma. Ani is the verb. Ani lo me the verb. Ivrit. So. So I have to speak in English like everybody else before me, unfortunately. Hopefully, the presentation is going to be interesting enough to be able to follow it. This is actually this presentation is a um, continuation of a um, work that Mentor Graphics has been doing with Micron and Socionext uh, in order to enhance the capabilities of um, DDR simulation. The reason we're doing this, it, it, it reminds me of a joke I heard um, a long time ago. A man has lost a ring, and he's looking for the ring. And somebody comes to help him. And he says, okay, let's, let's start looking for it. And after like five minutes, the, uh, the person asks, are you sure you lost the ring here? And the guy goes, no, 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 I lost it over there. And the guy goes, then why are we searching over here? Because there's a light over here. <laughs> so what happens is in simulation, sometimes you simulate something only because you can simulate this. But there might be a problem somewhere else that you don't catch because you don't have the tools, the light, to be able to simulate what you need to simulate. And this is one of those things that I'd like to highlight. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start with the introduction, where I'm going to tell you what the, uh, what the problem being addressed is, go on to talk about the challenges in simulation, um, about how we can simulate to address the issue, and then I'll show you why. I'll show you some situations which people don't think about which will be caught if you were to simulate this entire transaction. And I'll tell you about some of the future things that we should continue about, um, because what, what we're presenting here is not the complete solution, uh, it's just a partial, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of the future things that, that we're working on. So to give a bit of a background, uh, we have the DDR bus, uh, it, it's very popular to simulate the DDR bus because it's so large, it's uh, sometimes uh, you know, 72 bits wide just for the data and all the strobe. Um, and it's, it's got many different flavors, LPDDR, um, non-volatile DIMMs and so on. But uh, one of the key features of DDR, unlike CERDES, is that it's bi-directional for the data. CERDES, you have TX, you have RX, you just need to go one direction each way. Whereas with DDR, you can have somebody driving and then you could have somebody else driving on that same bus, which means that a given buffer, it might be driving one second, and then suddenly it might switch over to being high impedance. Or it might go from driver to ODT, to some kind of a termination, or, or ODT to high impedance. And this kind of transitioning is what this um, uh, talk is all about. And the reason that it's crucial is, if you're not careful, there could be energy remaining in the transmission line, and that energy that's sloshing around, it doesn't have anywhere to go, it could cause you trouble. And this needs to be modeled and simulated to make sure that this situation doesn't happen to you. There are two large, predominant ways of doing simulation right now. We can use IBIS models, for, when I say simulation, I mean for the driver models, the driver and the receiver models. Either the driver and the receiver models can be IBIS, or they can be SPICE-based. In large, SPICE has more details in it, it has more transistor-level logic in it, um, but it has some limitations as well. It takes a lot of time to run. IBIS, on the other hand, is much faster, but one of the key limitations of IBIS right now is that you can only make an IBIS buffer drive or receive at a given time. There is no, nowhere in there where you can change what it's doing during the simulation. SPICE. SPICE is created by the people who, who, who designed the chip. So from their perspective, it's all about the transistors. It has all the information about the detailed transistors about the buffer. That's great, but because it's so complicated, one of the big drawbacks of SPICE is time. And time in two ways. Number one, of course, we know how long it takes to run SPICE. But number two, which not too many people talk about, is how long it takes to set up SPICE. Because usually you have so many inputs into SPICE, to just get it to do exactly what you want it to do can take a long time. And then you run it for, 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 for a long time, and then you realize you made a stupid mistake, and you have to start the whole thing again. Big problem with SPICE. 
I will not be discussing SPICE too much here. I'll be talking about the more common method, which is IBIS. In IBIS, what it does is it makes a lot of assumptions because from a system designer perspective, the system designer doesn't really care about the transistors. They pretend to care, but they don't really care. They care about what the buffer does, how it's going to affect my trace, and whether I see my high and low thresholds the way it's supposed to be. So there are many assumptions made in IBIS. It takes the behavior of the, of the model, and it models the behavior as tables. Specifically, it has an IV, a current voltage table, and it has a, 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 a time voltage table, which describes what the signals look like over time when they, when they go up and when they go down. However, one of the assumptions that this makes, that IBIS makes, is that whenever you are driving, you're either going high or you're going low when you're driving. So if you're changing states, you're going from a zero to a one, or you're going from a one to a zero. Those are the only two things that you assume. So the way you would create an IBIS model, now which is the closest? Maybe this one. Um, the way you would create this IBIS model is you would, if, let's say you have a spice deck, you would enable the signal, you have an enable signal and you have the data that's coming in, you would keep the enable enabled all the time, and then you would say, let's change the data from a zero to a one, and you would observe what happens at the output, and you would record that. This is how this buffer transitions from a zero to a one, and you record that. The problem is, there is nowhere in IBIS which says what happens when it's going from a zero to a tri-state, or from a one to a tri-state, or vice versa. It doesn't exist in IBIS right now. Similarly, when we have ODT, that's when you're receiving the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the information, right now there are some IV tables, current voltage tables, which describe how that buffer uh, behaves when some ODT is on. However, it assumes that it stays on throughout. There is no way to turn that ODT on or off. So more IV tables are going to be needed in order to describe um, how to turn on or turn off the ODT. There is a way of, of modeling uh, ODT on versus ODT off using these submodel keywords in IBIS. However, even with this submodel, it is still static. You can either have ODT on, you can select ODT on, or you can select ODT off. However, however, there is a bus hold submodel keyword where you can tell it to change some characteristics of, of, of the buffer. However, 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 this needs that toggling, that thing that says change, is a voltage waveform that's needed. The simulating tool cannot tell it change now you need an external voltage, which, which becomes a headache. So this is another change that has to happen in IBIS, some small change in IBIS, in order to fully support this ability to say, okay, I'm ODT now, now I'm driving, now I'm high impedance. Also, the simulator needs to make some changes. We have to be able to accommodate these new IBIS keywords these new IBIS things, which, uh, which includes these brand new uh, uh, waveforms which go from, from zero to high impedance, or from ODT to high impedance, and so on. So what we did for our paper here is um, we modified our simulator tool, which is uh, our MetroGraphics hyperlinks tool, in order to be able to accommodate these new keywords. These new keywords in IBIS are not standard yet. One of the things that I've been doing is uh, going around in, in the different IBIS uh, committees uh, talking about this. Uh, my colleague, Arpad Murani, if, if some of you know him, uh, he's uh, one of the original people from IBIS. He's the first one who introduced this. We, we talked about this in DesignCon earlier this year, and I talked about this last week in, uh, in Italy in an IEEE SPI conference. So this is something we're trying to push, but it's not yet standardized. It takes time for these things to happen. So we have a, a proprietary uh, version of hyperlinks, if you will, which makes all these changes. So it's not industry standard yet. The, the hope is to make this industry standard going forward. From 
Micron and, and Socionext, and if you want to do this, whoever else, any other semiconductors that want to do this, what they will have to do is create some new data in the IBIS models. So in this case, in order to create the VT curves, that is how the uh, voltage changes over time, normally you fix output enable, and then you change whatever the input is. Let's say it goes from zero to one, and you see what the output looks like. Now what you do is you fix the input at Let's say, in this case, you fix it low, and then you toggle the output enable, and you see what the waveform looks like. So now what you're doing is you're transitioning from a high impedance to a high, to a one in this case. Similarly here, you're going to fix it as high. I'm, I'm sorry, I think it was a low because it's driving low here. It, the, it, the load is going high. So here you fix the data as high, and you change the output enable. So this started at tri-state, and then slowly it starts driving high, and you get that characteristic. This is not something that is done currently with, with any uh, IBIS generation. So this is one of the changes that has to be made in methodology. Similarly, you have to do the same thing for ODT as well. It's not shown in the diagrams here, but what you're gonna have to do is essentially have ODT enable change, and, and see what the waveforms look like as they change. Mm. What we're trying to show here is, when you do this, a new challenge arises. Namely, when you have output enable always enabled, and you just put an input in, and you see the output, the time from when you, you, the, the buffer comes in to when it comes out, it's minimal. Whereas now what's happening, it's, I'm afraid it's not terribly visible here, um, is that you now have a data coming in. Let's say you have a data high coming in and you say output enable, and you want to see what the behavior is like, unfortunately when you say output enable, there's a lot of logic inside that, that sub-circuit. And that logic has to start thinking. It has to say, oh, okay, there's stuff going on now. And much, 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 much later, it actually says, okay, I'm going to do it. And it might do a lot of other funny stuff in the middle. So the crucial thing here is here, you have to be careful that the timing is not messed up. That's not, I mean, it, it was much easier when you just had the input to go from low to high because the output is always enabled. So it's just kind of like a pass-through buffer. You can easily see the timing. Now, this is going to span multiple clock cycles because now you have the logic inside that SPICE model or, or, or your device that, that comes into the picture. Yes, please. Yes, uh, you're right, you're right, but uh, uh, that's a good question. The question is, why is this so predominant in DDR4? I would argue it's not even so much in DDR4 as the LP designs, because they care so much about the high impedance uh, to, to conserve power. Uh, one of the common reasons is speed, always. If you don't know the answer, it's speed or power, usually. So in this case, the reason it's speed is the length that you have is not changing too much. But the speed is increasing, so now the time that it takes to go back and forth, it's starting to become a significant fraction of a clock cycle. Whereas before, yeah, you could just let it ring out. Now that ring out, it's not so insignificant anymore. So now that energy that stays there can do some real harm. Whereas before, uh, you can close your eyes and pretend it's not there and, you know, the board comes back and it works and your manager doesn't ask, you're okay. Now there's a real problem um, that, we, that we've been seeing. So, the, you know, that, that leads me to another question that's not in this slide. Um, uh, part of the reason that this thing happens is you have high impedance. I showed this on the second slide. You have high impedance, high impedance on both ends, so the energy has nowhere to go. So nowadays, these, uh, la, these uh, smartphones and stuff, these are dominating over servers before. These guys are very power sensitive. They, don't wa they want to sip on the power. They don't want to take anything. So using ODT-80, 80 ohms is too much. You can't use a ODT-80 because that, that, that takes too much power. You want to use as low an ODT as possible. You don't want to use any termination. Termination takes power. So when you have no termination, there's nowhere for the energy to go. So that's a new trend that's starting now, this, this power conservation. And that's another reason that this thing will happen because you can easily imagine you inject some power into this transmission line, you have high impedance, high impedance, it goes nowhere, you got a problem when the next time you're trying to do something. 
That's another reason that this thing is becoming more significant. So what we did here was uh, after we created these new IBIS files and after we created a new hyperlinks version which supports this, this, this new uh, requirements, we wanted to see how accurate it is. And to compare, we took um, a spice, we took IBIS, uh, the new IBIS that we've created, uh, and we did a read-write transaction. So basically you start from tri-state, uh, this is an LPDDR3 if I remember right, um, I'm sorry, this is a DDR4. Um, well, we ran it at 2133 meg uh, megatransfers per second uh, and, and we, we saw what happens when you start from tri-state, you do a typical read transaction, go back to tri-state, do a write transaction. Compare what happens with IBIS, with the new IBIS that we're proposing, and SPICE. Ugh. Let me actually skip through a couple here. So, in the first part over here, both of them are tri-state. The first two are the P and the N. So this is the P and the N of the DQS, the strobe. So this is the P and uh, this is the P and N. This is the P and N. The, the top one is controller. The bottom one is DRAM. So you have controller, DRAM, controller, DRAM, PN, PN, differential, differential. Purple is spice. Green is ibis. Uh, you might wonder why there's only purple because the green is right under it, which, which is a good thing because that means that the spice and the ibis really correlate very well. So what we did here was we started tri-state, tri-state, so nobody's doing anything. And then over here, the controller says, I'm going ODT. So it's changing from not doing anything. It's going to start its ODT, so it has termination now. And a little bit after that, the DRAM starts driving, like you would in a typical read transaction. And after a little bit, the, the, the DRAM says what it needs to, and then it stops driving. And the ODT of the controller goes away, so they're both tri-state again, not talking. And then the DRAM says, okay, I'm going to terminate, and the, and the controller starts driving, like a typical write. And then again, they go tri-state. This is wonderful. We've got this comparison. And the real reason why this is of so much interest is this here. For the simple transaction with Spice, it took 77 minutes with a top-line computer. With my laptop, it took 30 seconds with IBIS. You can do it like this. You make a mistake, boom, you try it again, no problem. Whereas with Spice, you have to fudge the results somehow to say yes, it's okay or not, depending on what your manager says, whether you have to release it tomorrow or not. With IBIS, you can actually get it to work. And this is the reason that we're, we're, we're pushing for this, because um, these problems can be caught with, with IBIS so much faster. Uh, let me pause here. Any questions? Okay. So now I'm going to show you why this is interesting. I'm going to show you three cases where if you don't think about these problems, uh, you might run into issues. So I'm going to show you three examples of issues that, that, we, uh, that we simulated where um, these are like template cases. So your situation is of course going to be different than exactly one of these. It could be a merger of several of these. But these are the concepts of, of where you might have a problem. Fundamentally though, the problem is high impedance, high impedance, energy has nowhere to go. That, that's what's causing this fundamental problem. These are just different flavors of it. Uh, what we're going to do is start with the easiest one that we can think of. Uh, we have a transmitter and a weak terminator receiver. And then after a while, the, the, the transmitter stops driving. And there's nowhere for the energy to go. So it just keeps going back and forth. And the next time somebody drives, there might be a problem. That's the first one we're going to start with. And what we have here is a hyperlinks. That's the mentor graphic simulation tool that we're using. Uh, the, the hyperlink setup has a controller and two DRAMs to simulate two ranks. Those two ranks are kind of close to each other here. Um, first, the, the controller is going to write to rank one, and after a while, it's going to write to rank two and see what the results are. It's going to be running 2133 megatransfers per second, LPDDR3, because LPDDR, again, is power sensitive. Um, and we're just going to draw, drive some zeros and ones, like any strobe would do. So the, the, the baseline case is the, the controller drives four zeros and four ones, so four cycles, so eight bits total, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And then it stops driving. It, it, it goes tri-state. And then after eight 
more cycles, it's going to start driving again. As you can see, after the first set of um, uh, zeros and ones, because there's nowhere for that energy to go, there is still some ringing. And this ringing could cause a preamble miscalculation at the DRAM in the subsequent eight bits. Because this peak-to-peak -peak could just be enough to make the receiver think it's a real DQS. So what are the things you could do about this? One thing you could do is you could see if you have the option of actually terminating one of those two ranks. Maybe you can change it from uh, nothing to 240 ohms to maybe even 120 ohms. So as you can see from this ringing here, with, with, um, uh, with, with nothing you have four, four, uh, four, 450 millivolts peak to peak, and as you get stronger and stronger termination, it comes down to like 25 millivolts. So that's acceptable. So this is an analysis you can do. If let's say you don't have the option of ODT, because again, you're power sensitive. So maybe you decide to leave more UI between transaction one and transaction two. Eight UI is too quick. Is 16 okay? Is 32 okay? This is something you need to tell your firmware engineer what needs to be done. So what happens here is, uh, in, in this test, when we don't leave any time at all, this is the baseline, the orange is the baseline case, but then we leave 8 UI. With 8 UI, uh, we get more dampening of that signal, so we get something like uh, 230 millivolts. So maybe that's okay for you, maybe it's not. Or maybe you decide, no, I want it to damp even more, so you let, you, you let it go for an even longer time. And then you get uh, something like, say, 35 millivolts. Maybe this works for you. Or maybe you decide, no, I just want to go slow. I don't think anything is visible here. This is going at um, 1066 megatransfers per second. This is the original one. And what happens when you go this slow is, again, it dampens down quite a bit. Now, again, you might be asking yourself, so what? I can simulate this. Not quite. Because remember, the key ingredient here than traditional stuff that you've been simulating is between the first part and the second part, there's a transition for the transmitter. It used to be driving, now it stops driving. The only real way you can do this right now is by using SPICE. And if you use SPICE, you're going to spend your life doing this. And maybe a safe job, but it, it, it takes a long time. Then you can make a table out of this and you can actually do an analysis with this now. You, you can figure out um, uh, you know, whether you need to spend more UI between uh, a read and a write or, or whatever. At least you have the capability now of doing this quickly. It's a question of taking maybe, let's say realistically, it might take like maybe two weeks or something to do this, get this table um, using Spice. You might be able to do this in a day or two if you're efficient in IBIS. Second case. If the ODT happens to come a little bit later than it should, so there's an ODT signal which tells the DRAM that, okay, now turn your termination on. If that signal happens to come a bit late to the DRAM, it's possible that for a short duration of time, there's no ODT. So it's the, the, the transmitter might just be driving to high impedance at the receiver. What we're gonna do here is, well, Ah, so ideally ODT is enabled before the data is received at the DRAM, but for different reasons, it could come a little bit late, and that could cause a problem. Why could this happen? There are several reasons this could happen. Um, depending on the technology that you're using, uh, you might have an explicit ODT signal, which, which tells the DRAM ODT on off, or it might be a part of the address command, which says, okay, after this many clock cycles, then turn the ODT on. It could be because the ODT signal is routed a little bit off. It could be because the address bus is routed off, or maybe the, the training didn't happen correctly between the DQS and the clock. In this example, we're going to abstract away why that ODT becomes delayed. We're just going to assume, uh, let's see what happens when the ODT gets delayed. And the example we're going to take here is we're going to run at uh, 1600 megatransfers per second. Uh, and we're going to see what happens when there is the ODT happens before uh, the, the DRAM receives versus what happens when it gets delayed just a little bit. Sure enough, if 
you enable that ODT early, then um, you get a nice clean ringing signal, like exactly like what you would see. It's, 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 it's a perfect clock, nothing to see here. This is what you expect to see most of the time, and this is what you will see if you, if you simulate an IBIS today, because this is all you can do. But if you assume or if you figure out that the ODT is coming a little bit late, then in the beginning, there's going to be undershoot, like you would expect, because the receiver has high impedance. And this kind of a problem is actually really insidious, because you might not see this, and your prototype, your bring up, will pass. And you're going to say, fine, wonderful, everything passes, you start for manufacturing, and four months later, somebody has a problem somewhere because some DRAM got burnt out because of the undershoot area limit. And because this damages DRAMs over time. And this can be a very expensive thing to fix. To first detect what's going on and then to, 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 to fix it can be a real problem. Something that simulation is supposed to solve way well before. Doesn't seem like big until it happens to you. <laughs> this is one of those things. Similarly, there could also be a problem if ODT gets enabled a little too late. Because if it's enabled late, usually there's a time limit for how long that ODT needs to be enabled. So if it gets, ena I'm sorry, if it gets enabled early, it's going to get disabled early as well. If there's some miscoordination about how long it needs to be enabled. Enabled early, disabled early. So to see what, what kind of a consequence you have when this happens, we have, well, the causes are similar. So maybe the ODT trace is a little bit too short, or the address trace is too short, or, or, or the uh, calibration uh, is, is, is messed up for that transaction. Same causes, same assumption. We're going to ign ignore how it happened, and just to assume that it happened and see the consequences here. We're going to take and at the same kind of a situation, 1,600 megatransfers per second, and uh, see what happens when, uh, we're, we're going to see what happens when the ODT happens where it's supposed to and gets disabled where it's supposed to. Then we're going to see what happens when ODT happens a bit early and gets disabled a little bit early. Nothing to see here. It happens when it's supposed to, it gets disabled when it's supposed to, you get a nice clean ringing. So this is the stimulus we're giving at the controller. You get a nice clean receiver um, stimulus as well. But I'm sure you can imagine if you, in this first part of it here on the left part, it's terminated properly. But ODT in this case gets, uh, the termination gets removed a little too soon because it got enabled a little too soon. And then you have all this energy that you don't want just floating around there. This, I'm sure you can imagine, can cause some kind of a problem for your subsequent transaction. If there's a read that's being done next time when the DRAM is trying or when the controller is trying to send something. So, this is just the start because there's so many things that we have not yet taken into consideration. Uh, we have not taken into consideration um, RTT PARC, RTT NOM, all these different ODT values that, 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 that could happen in a DRAM. We've taken into consideration high impedance, a given termination, and drive. What if it goes from ODT 40 to ODT 120? We don't yet have that data in here yet, one step at a time. Also, we have to remember, these are not official yet. This is something that we're pushing to make official um, because I think it's going to, uh, we think it's going to be beneficial to, to customers, especially the customers who have already told us, why can't we do this already? Um, there's another thing here that was pointed out in my previous presentation uh, that, that's missing here, uh, which is power aware. We're, we have also not yet started taking power aware into consideration, but that's another future thing that we should be taking into account, especially when dealing with things like um, LPDDR4, uh, which, which can be power sensitive. With that, I am the last presenter, um, finishing in time, well within time. Any questions? Yes. All those phenomena can be measured <coughs> on the board. Usually you see can change the days with, the, with your firmware. Why do I need to simulate? Oh, now we're talking a different philosophical question. The question is, I can measure all this stuff on my board. Why do I need to simulate it? Uh, 
that's not specific to this, uh, uh, trend, uh, you know, the transition between reads and writes. That's a question of why do we need to simulate in the first place? Um, oh, where do I even start? Uh, imagine you have a problem on your board. If you have a problem on your board, you're going to get another three months before you get the next board back. What if you found that problem before you released your board? Then you just saved all that time and expense. That money that you save uh, versus the time it takes you to run this, that's the balance that you have to fundamentally do. That's not specific to this transition between reads writes, that's any kind of simulation in general. It can save you time in the number of uh, repeat boards that you might have to do because you find an error when you measure, instead of finding it before you release. Hey, I'm Amir from Mentor Israel. I had a customer, I will not uh, uh, reveal who it is, that uh, had a device that he cannot change the firmware on this device. And uh, he and this device failed in, the, in uh, real uh, life because of this uh, transition between write and read phenomena. He had a glitch that uh, is, was destroying all his data. And he complained, okay, why simulation didn't uh, find, find it? How I can find it? So this is one reason why we did it. Yes. Taking into account the limitation of IBIS models that you have stated, how are the IBIS models that I receive now from the DDR manufacturer, are they reliable? Do they simulate real life conditions? Uh, there are actually two different questions in your question there. One is, how are they reliable with respect to read-write transitions? And the other question is, how are they reliable in general? Those are both very legitimate questions. So the question is, he has IBIS models, how reliable are they? To answer the second question first, the IBIS model is only as good as the engineer that created it. If it's a brand new engineer who just got chewed into this, which has happened many times, there are going to be errors. But then there's going to be errors with spice also, if that person is careless in, gen in, in generating the spice for you. So it always is good for you if you verify how that spice, uh, the uh, IBIS is generated and whether they know what they're talking about by looking through the IBIS every time. Because there have been cases where there have been careless errors injected into them. IBIS itself, if done correctly, there have been loads of correlation studies which show that IBIS and SPICE from a, from a PCB simulation perspective are practically just as good as each other. So the question is, how good are those people generating the stuff? And in a way, you can extrapolate the same thing for the read-write tran uh, for the transitions as well. It becomes how carefully have they generated these new waveforms, which are more complicated now, and made sure that the appropriate data is in the IBIS files. As long as those are there, they should be practically identical to SPICE. Yes. yes. Ah, uh, question is, is this already implemented in Hyperlix? And ah, and how do we publish in Hyperlinks? How do, how do we create the new keywords? Uh, yes and no. It is in Hyperlinks, but not a version you can get. <laughs> it was meant for us, uh, for this paper. This is still in its infancy, uh, because we've been hearing a lot more of these cases where these problems have come about, just like Amir said, uh, that, that customers have not simulated this and, and they're getting bit hard, and so now they're coming back, so now we're starting to work on this, so we're cr still creating awareness about this. Um, like any vendor, if you pay us enough money, you'll get it. <laughs> but, uh, but the general answer is not yet. So I think this is going to mature a little more in the coming months, and then you should be able to get, uh, probably from the other vendors as well, but uh, 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 from Mentor Graphics, uh, not just the tool, but also the instructions on how to create it. It should also be in the IBIS uh, committee for how to create these new things. Yes. Hey. I'm sorry, why not just use a multiplexer? I'm sorry, I, I, I bet. Uh, 
you can implement the MOOCs and then you can take the OTT off or the IBIS off and then operate. Impl implement a multiplexer where? In a simulation. I guess let me ask you this. How do you even know you need to implement it in the first place? Otherwise, you're wasting space, you're wasting a lot of resources, wasting thought process into implementing it. How do you even know you need it in the first place? Only in a simulation, not in the yeah. real life. That's what I'm saying. To yeah, simulate, you need to simulate first, right? I mean, in simulation, you can add a very low gate box and then switch the IBIS off and then operate another RDT in order to simulate the behavior of IBIS off. I think we have to talk about this offline. It, it's probably a good idea, but uh, it's just not going in. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing where the mux goes in there, but I'm sure it has a place. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.